Good morning. Lord Jesus Christ, on the first Palm Sunday, you entered the rebellious city where you were to die. Enter our hearts, we pray, and subdue, subdue them to yourself. And as your disciples blessed your coming and spread garments and branches in your way, make us ready to lay at your feet all that we have and all that we are, that we too may bless your coming in the name of the Lord. Our prayer of praise and adoration. As the crowds welcomed Christ, acclaiming him as the one who came in the name of the Lord, give us insight not only to recall these events, but to discern their meaning for our lives. Now as we gather to offer you our praise, in the name of Jesus, amen. God, whose love lasts forever, your only son took the form of a servant and not holding on tightly to equality with you, gave himself completely, remaining obedient right to death. Through your spirit's work in us, help us to think like Christ so that having his attitude, we may share his humility and be with him in his glory. Please pray our prayer confession together with me. We confess that we are not so different from those who welcomed Christ into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, yet later shouted, crucify him, or remain silent in the face of injustice. We have betrayed you too, Lord Jesus, by our sins both secret and known. Yet you died for people like us, and you rose on the third day that we might be redeemed. For the sake of Jesus Christ, do not hold our sins against us. Jesus Christ, our King of glory, we have not been outspoken for you. We have not called for your death, but neither have we shouted of your greatness, nor expressed delight in the salvation you have won for us. Help us to see your glory. Draw us closer to you, that we may become more faithful and more joyful servants of the King. Our assurance of pardon today comes from the Psalms. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from my enemies and those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. In Christ, God hears. God hears and God answers. And God answers and sets us free. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
illumination, Lord, who still speaks. In all the clamor of the world, none is more true than you, and no word is more reliable than yours. Through your spirits working in our lives, enable us to quiet all these other voices and listen for your word. Speak to us of our King who draws close in peace and offers life even at the cost of his own, that we might be faithfully, joyfully, and clearly his in lives given to your service. Have you ever had this experience? It's 4th of July, and you go down to the little neighborhood setup where they're selling fireworks, and you decide to spend $10 on the biggest firework rocket that you can find. And so you're so excited because you bring it home, you bring it to your 4th of July party, you're stoked, you light the match, you, you run far away, you kind of turn, you plug your ears and you count down, you're waiting for the rocket to go off. And then nothing. It makes a noise, the little zzz, and then nothing. It just fizzles out. It's, it's a dud. It didn't even work. And here you spent all this money, you know, and you built up your family thinking, gosh, this is going to be a great thing. And it's a dud. Palm Sunday, that first Sunday, was very similar to that. People came expecting Jesus to ride in and do these great things. And it ended up being a dud. It's a usual day, usual Passover time. There's hundreds of thousands of people who have flocked to Jerusalem for the festival. Literally, some people would say millions of people. And the rumors about Jesus had spread from town to town. And so not only were there people who there normally for the Passover, there were some who would come to see, you know, what this whole thing with Jesus was about too. And so Jesus came riding into town on a donkey at the head of a procession. You know, they had heard that the Messiah would come and they had prophecies about what that would be like. And so people began taking their, their coats off their backs and laying down palm branches and taking them from the trees and laying them down because that's what you would do in a procession for a king or for a conquering hero. And they did this before Jesus as he entered Jerusalem. And they chanted together, Hosanna, son of David, Hosanna, son of David. Well, they knew the Messiah would come, bringing them peace. And Jesus approached the center square of the city, and the crowd was probably intense. You know, you can imagine them packed shoulder to shoulder, and here he comes riding in this on this donkey. And the crowd is wondering, they're waiting, what's going to happen? Wondering if the heavens are going to open up, wondering, you know, is he going to give this great speech? What's going to happen? And Jesus simply gets off his donkey and walks up to the temple where he had, you know, taught many times before. And they're thinking, okay, maybe something's going to happen at the temple. Maybe, maybe the, the stones will start flying off the temple. Maybe something will happen over there. But they looked around and then he came out of the temple and nothing happened. And then Jesus said, let's go to Bethany wait a minute, nothing happened in Jerusalem? And now he's going to go to Bethany. What a dud. What happened? This promised Messiah who was going to do something. There's this buildup and then a fizzle. The next day, they would start to chant, crucify him, crucify him. And so those really happy cheers of Hosanna quickly turn to anger. But why did it happen? Why was this such a fizzler? Why was this such a dud? How come Jesus, of all things, the Messiah that got so built up, why was there such a letdown? Once again, it seems like God's people misunderstood the promises of God. Once again, we misunderstood our needs. We misunderstood the promise that God was trying to communicate in the first place. And then we twist those promises around to meet our own needs, what we thought. And we twist them. Let me explain about the promises of God. 
You see, in the Old Testament, God promises to give the people the promised land. We know about that. We've heard that in our Bible studies before or reading the Old Testament. We hear of the land of milk and honey. We hear of this beautiful place, this promised land. But what we don't want to listen to is the ugly parts of the story about how it would take 200 years of, of fighting and wrestling for this promised land to finally be theirs. They wanted to hear the good stuff, but they didn't want to hear the other stuff. Let me give you another example. When the Jewish people were taken into Babylonian captivity, God promised a new Jerusalem. He promised a, a shining capital. He promised you know, that everything would be restored. And so when the Jews came back from Babylon and they returned, you can imagine their high hopes thinking, well, the temple's still going to be there. Everything's going to be great when we get back. And they come back and they find out that the temple is in ruins. There is no gleaming stones. They've been knocked over. They've been, everything that was consecrated has now been made um, dirty and filthy and they've got to start all over again and they've got nothing they've got to start over again this is not what they were hoping for and they thought this is God's promise is that what this looks like but again they misunderstood the promises of God God promised these things but God didn't promise that there wouldn't be suffering, that there wouldn't be struggle, that there might not be hardship. That was the part of it that they didn't want to think about, that they didn't even want to be aware about. And so they're wondering, is this really what God had promised? All over the Old Testament, we've got prophecies about who the Messiah would be. We've got the Christmas hymns, remember, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, all these wonderful names. And we've got the Old Testament prophecies again and again and again about who this Messiah would be. And yet they picked up the parts that were pretty. They picked up the parts that they wanted to lift up. They forgot about the Messiah as the suffering servant. They forgot about the hardships that this one would go through. They wanted to think about the pretty part of the promise and not the hard part of the promise. And so here comes Jesus, who's a carpenter, not a conquering war hero, who comes in riding a donkey instead of a war horse, who comes in, you know, omitting all the parts of the promise that they want to see, the one who's going to come in power and who's going to come and change all of this. But was God's promise still true? Yeah. But they wanted to hear the pretty side of the promise that they wanted to hear and not the whole part of the promise. And so what happens when it feels like that God's promises end up like dust in our mouths or ones that we don't really want to accept? Is God just fooling us with these words? Or is it us? that's distorting the promises of God because we want it to be in just this small little narrow thing of how we want it to be and how acceptable it will be to us. I think when we think about the promises of God, we don't ever want to think that they would be hardship or suffering or even death or struggle. It's kind of like wanting a rose, but only wanting the part that's at the top the beautiful part with the red petals that, that open up. And maybe we'll take, you know, the stem and the leaves, but not the thorns. We're going to break those off, and we might put up with some of the roots, but really we just want the top part. We just want the pretty part. But you can't grow a rose bush without thorns. It's there for protection. It's got its purpose, and yet we want to strip it of all of that because we just want the part that's the way that we want it. But how many of us have been sold a bill of goods? We got married. 
and people said, oh, you're going to live happily ever after. And then you wake up in the morning and the person next to you has bad breath, has their hair in curlers, um, has a scruffy beard, you know, is not, doesn't look like the person that you married when, when you first married them. You've got kids, maybe, maybe the kids get sick, maybe you've got teenagers that throw tantrums, even though they're not two, they're now 12 or 13 or 16. Is that marriage happily ever after? Of course it is. It's part of that. Whether you are living in plenty or whether you're having problems with, with money, whether you're having problems with your kids or your grandkids or whatever that is, whether you've been diagnosed with cancer or maybe you're going to lose your spouse to an untimely death. Is that part of God's happily ever after? It might just be. Because God doesn't promise us that there's not going to be struggles and hardship and all of these other things. God promises marriage. God promises fidelity. And when we live into those things, even those other things can be part of that promise, can be part of that growth. But sometimes we don't want to think about the parts that we don't want to think about. And when we think about this Sunday, Palm Sunday, oftentimes we just want the palm branches and the celebration. We want Palm Sunday, but we don't want Passion Sunday, the Sunday that leads up to Holy Week and ends in Easter. We want to go from one celebration to the next celebration without the stuff in between. We just want to go from joy to joy. So what are some of the other promises of God? God promises us peace, and peace permeates all of the New, Te New Testament and Old Testament, and we're promised peace, but what price does peace come with? God promises justice, but God doesn't promise that justice will be easy. Justice has to be fought for and won. Paul constantly struggled. He constantly argued with people. He almost didn't have a moment of peace. If that's the kind of peace that Paul had, why are we surprised that even peace and justice and other things take struggle and take work? Anytime that we're in a struggle for truth and justice, there will be a struggle. But God walks with us in those times. And so when we kind of twist these promises of God and when we think that, that peace will just be like floating from one cloud to the next, we may be missing out on what God is really doing there because we find this false sense of tranquility that we, that we want, but we don't want to look at all the things around us. And so what might that look like? Maybe we live in our little suburb. Maybe we live in these little walled off places thinking, okay, but somebody else will take care of the things on the other side of the suburb that are not quite so nice to look at. Or maybe you just don't go down that street. Or maybe you think that someone else will give to the food pantry because you don't want to have to think about the fact that there's some people without food, even now. What are the pretty parts that we want to go to? And what are the parts that we don't want to look at at all? In America, we want to have the wife, the kids, you know, the, the happy life, all of these things. We want to have our TV. We want to have all of our, our things. We want these things around us so that we're comfortable. And when things happen and they're not comfortable and things are a struggle, sometimes we think that we're outside the promises of God. And yet that's not true. Stephen, who was the first martyr, he was not promised an easy life. Does that surprise us? I'll give you two other examples. Nelson Mandela spent decades in prison in South Africa. He was on the other side of a political system, and yet 
when he was in prison, he still felt himself free, whether or not he would be released from that prison or not. And so just like that first martyr, Stephen, Stephen felt himself free, even though it meant his death. Alexander Solzhenitsyn was in prison in Russia. Again, prison, in prison for political reasons, and yet he felt himself free. And he writes about that, and you can read his stories. And you don't think about somebody being in prison or being on the other side of a situation. You don't think about them as being free. But if we just look at going from joy to joy to joy, we might think that when we experience troubles or hardships or persecution or whatever that looks like, we might think that we're on the wrong side of God's promise. Christian history shows us that that's not necessarily the case. Jesus suffered and died. And although we're not supposed to seek out those things, as a part of normal life, things will happen. Hardships will happen. Suffering will happen. But God is with us in the midst of those hardships. And so sometimes we come disillusioned because we have this idea of who we want God to be and how God's promises should be and how God's miracles should happen in our life. And that if we're not being blessed by those things, then there's something wrong with us. Maybe it's because we just want to hear about the pretty side of the rose blossom and not about any of the rest of it. But the fulfillment of God's promises means that even with suffering and, and struggles, we will still find peace and life and freedom when we're in Christ. All of the great promises of God involved struggle and hardships. And there's always going to be thorns that are going to grow on that rose bush. And intuitively, we want to avoid that. And we want God to help us avoid those thorns. But in doing so, we might be deleting part of the promise or part of this journey that God has for us. We want Palm Sunday. And we pray, Lord, just give me Palm Sundays all the time or just give me Easter's all the time. We don't want Passion Sunday. But in the midst of walking through Passion Sunday, we can find abundant life and freedom. Many great things in life are won through suffering and through struggle and eventually in seeing freedom on the other side and it makes you appreciate those things so much more. So today, is it Palm Sunday or is it Passion Sunday? Because for those who walk with Christ, every Sunday is both Passion Sunday and Palm Sunday. And for those who believe and walk the way of the cross, you have to have Passion Sunday before you have Palm Sunday and Easter. Amen. Our introduction to the offering. Thanksgiving God, who is present everywhere and at all times, we praise you that in the events from Palm Sunday to Good Friday, as Jesus Christ entered the city, taught in the temple, broke bread in the upper room and was lifted on the cross, you opened to us the path to eternal life. Trusting in the one who has come in your name, may we serve you in the new life you offer us and walk faithfully in your ways all the days of our lives. Amen. Gracious God, as the whole city was stirred when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the shouts of the crowd heard above the clamor at market stalls, the eager, eager discussions of the theologians, the ordinary business of life. 
we give ourselves heart and soul, mind and body, time and wealth to honor Jesus Christ, your Son, as Lord, that those who live and work around us may see him and trust in his redeeming love to your glory. If you'll bow your heads with me as we pray. Things change so quickly. For Jesus, the cheers of the crowd became jeers from those who wanted him condemned. We know in a world of quick and sometimes terrible change, we need to pray continually. We pray to you, Lord of the palm branches and the cross, for you understand us, and in love you've promised not to push away any who come to you. So we pray for people who feel pushed away, pushed away from a living faith in Jesus by pressure from friends and family, those who feel pushed away by other people in churches if they don't share the same kind of ideas or ways or clothes, for people who are pushed out by those who want power, whose main love is to be noticed or to have control. We pray for your church, that all those who trust in Jesus will be made able by your spirit to follow his humility, to see and imitate his servant life, to welcome and not condemn. Lord, help your church to be like you. We pray to you, Lord, of palm branches and the cross, for you know the warm glow of being praised and the loneliness of being hated. We pray for world leaders, quick to stand in the limelight, taking decisions which will affect everyone in the world, but slow at times to do the steady, less glamorous work to which they're called. We pray for world leaders to understand their role to serve the peoples of the world, that posturing will be replaced by practical action to make a difference, that jockeying for position will be replaced by genuine efforts to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, and to care for those who are weak. In days when food banks are required in our land to feed families who struggle to provide for the basics of life, we ask that you would rearrange our priorities and help us to live more like Jesus. We pray to you, Lord of palm branches and the cross, because you know how quickly life changes to death. We pray for those who have recently lost someone who they love. The shock, the confusion, the pain, and the sorrow, especially of unexpected loss. We pray for hearts to be open to the comfort of your spirit, shown through friendship and community as deep calls to deep. And we remember those we know who mourn in these days, who need to be sure that you invite those in sorrow to turn to you, and we name them before you now. We ask God of grace that you will make us like some of the crowd, that we would follow Jesus and give him our praise in the way that we live, that we would turn away from wrong and evil and stand on the master's side, that we would be faithful in worshiping the one who has come in the Lord's name through our singing, our worship, our prayers, our attention, and giving our skills and time and in the offering that we make. Bless this, we pray, as your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
for our benediction, I want to share with you these sending words. And now we lay down the palm branches, and with them we lay down our belief that there is another way for you to be God. As the last echo of the final Alleluia fades, so does our hope that this journey can end in another way. As the week stretches ahead, gloryless and painful, whether we walk with faith or none, we look towards the cross, knowing that it is the most human and the most divine of all journeys. We travel this road with courage, with love, and with the uneasy peace that is the gift of faith in this holiest of weeks. Amen.